Today, I want to share with you a title, something that's entitled Secret to a Loving Heart. And I want to, it's a long passage. So what I want to do is let me read it to you. And uh, let me just read it to you. And uh, please follow along in your heart. It's, it's from Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. It's a little bit long, so bear with me. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on him. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he's talking about Jesus, he would know what kind of a woman is touching him. She, wa she was a prostitute. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts, because Jesus knew his thoughts. He said, Simon, that was his name, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debt. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's, that's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You can neglect it to the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, there are many, and there are many have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is an amazing story, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. But before that, I want to talk a little bit about my relationship with my wife that I, that I often do. Uh, I think most of you do not know this, but um, many of you know. I, my uh, wedding story is, uh, is something that I often say, don't do as I do. Do as I say. That means, you know, not everything that I do, obviously, I am not proud of. And not everything that I, I did, you know, I did them right. I didn't. So there are certain things, you know, don't follow my example. Don't do as I did, but do as I say. What I mean is, when I got married, I first spoke to my wife. And this is, you'll be amazed. I spoke to my wife in February the 8th. 2000, year 2000. I first spoke to my wife on the phone. I remember all these dates because February the 8th was her birthday. I called her. I had gotten her phone number. Somebody introduced us. I had gotten her phone number and I called her and I remember that day because it was her birthday and uh, uh, we spoke for about you know 40 minutes and the reason we spoke for such a long short period of time was because her date was waiting for her outside when I, was, when I called her. It was her birthday, and some guy offered to take her out to eat, and she actually made him wait 40 minutes because I would not let her hang out. And then I spoke to her throughout the week. My first date with my wife was February the 14th. I remember that date because it is Valentine's Day. I flew to Chicago. We met, and we ate dinner. And then February the 20th, I got ordained. I became a reverend. I was no longer chondosa in Korean word, but I became a moksa, a reverend. And 
That day is also special because on February the 20th, I asked Esther to come and attend my uh, uh, ordination service because I thought to myself, well, you know, she might, you know, I have a good feeling about her. You know, I might, she might be the one, and I didn't want her to miss my such an important date. So I asked her to fly in, and her brother lives in Chicago, so she did. And uh, to make the long story short, after the ordination service, I took her to a nice restaurant in Houston, and we ordered coffee, and uh, before the coffee came out, I knelt down and I said, will you marry me? And she said, of course. Literally, literally she said, 당연하지, which means, of course. And we got married. Did you follow along? February the 8th, February the 14th, and the February the 20th. And then we got married on April 29th. And because we got married without much courtship, and again, I don't recommend this. I, I believe you should have about six months to a year courtship, just so you can kind of get to know each other. You know, because we didn't really know each other and we got married, oh, we fought a lot. <laughs> we fought a lot. And, and during that time, I remember on many occasions, I would often pray to God. And I'd say, God, you know, because I would, I mean, really, we fight a lot because we were so different. My wife is very strong. And so am I. I'm very strong, too. And, and for me, I'm very traditional. I'm very westernized, but when it comes to the role of a husband and wife, I'm very traditional. <laughs> My wife is just the opposite. <laughs> She's Koreanized in every way except for the role of a husband and wife. She's very liberal and westernized. And so we fought a lot, you know? And I remember we fought, and I would, you know, after a while, you know, sometimes I would even say, did I even marry the right woman? And I say, you know, is it possible for me to divorce my wife and still be a pastor? I mean, and a lot of things went through my head, you know. I'm not saying I dwelt on them, but, you know, a lot of things go through my head. You know, of course, I didn't go through any of those things. But then instead, I decided to pray to God. And I say, God, please, you know, give me a loving heart for my wife. Because at times, I really couldn't love my wife. At times, I got so mad at her, I would just, you know, slam everything. That's my personality. You know, I don't want to break anything, so I just slam things. And, and then I, I go out. And I drive around for like two, three hours, and I come back. And I did that many times my first, first year of marriage. But, you know, and then after a while, you know, I didn't like my wife, and I started getting bitter towards her. But I didn't want that because she's my wife. I know that in marriage, she's supposed to be my best friend. And I know that in marriage, I'm supposed to love her more than anyone else in this world other than God. And I knew that that was what was right. So I spent a lot of time praying to God, God, please give me a loving heart. I, had to, I asked God, God, I want to love my wife really with all my heart. I don't want to try to love her. I don't want to choose to love her. I want to love her with all my heart. And I really prayed that for a long time. But the reality was, that didn't happen. And the reason why it didn't happen and God showed me was this. A loving heart is not something that is something magical. See, I just expected that, you know, since I prayed a lot, all of a sudden God's going to fill me with his spirit like poof. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, honey, where are you? I love you, you know. I... But it didn't happen like that. I realized that that's not where loving heart came from. Over time, I came to realize where truly loving, loving heart comes from, loving someone, not just your spouse, but loving someone. I realized a loving heart, and listen carefully to this, it comes out from a heart of a gratitude. See, loving heart, it comes from a heart of gratitude. And I realized that over the years that you know, it doesn't matter how long I pray. If I was not thankful and grateful for my wife, nothing mattered. In Luke chapter 7, the verse that we just read, it really gives us a wonderful picture of a loving heart. Why, you know, where it comes from and what, it result, what that loving heart really is. Just to go back to go over the story that we just read, this is a story about a Pharisee, a religious person. Okay, please don't say Christian. I don't consider myself a religious person. I am a Christian that loves God. 
But in this story, there were a bunch of religious people. They invited Jesus over for dinner. And they did it not necessarily because they loved him, but they just wanted to kind of watch over him, you know? You know, is he what everyone else says he is? You know, is he really, you know, let's see, let's see if he's going to make any mistakes. So they invited Jesus over for dinner. And while Jesus was reclining, all of a sudden, over here he says, uh, immoral woman. She was basically a prostitute, someone that sold her body for money. A, a sinful, I mean, probably in that culture, women was a second-class citizen. But on top of that, if you lived that type of lifestyle, you were the worst. You were no better than dogs. All of a sudden, this woman, she was not invited, but she had heard that Jesus came. So she snuck in. Well, I'm not sure she snuck in, but she came in, and then all of a sudden, from the moment that she entered, she would not stop crying. And she knelt down on her knees, went to Jesus' feet. And she could not just stop crying. She kept crying and crying so much that it, her tears were so great that it, it just, it, you know, it was able to, with that tear, wash and wipe away all the dust from Jesus' feet. And she used her hair to dry them. And then, from out of nowhere, something, a jar that she had brought, she opened an alabaster jar, a large jar filled with perfume, and she began to pour the perfume on Jesus' feet. And all the while, she could not stop kissing his feet. And the Pharisee, he thought, Aha! I caught Jesus. Look at him. He's, you know, people call him prophet, man of God, who's supposed to be wise and smart, and yet look at him. He, does not, he doesn't even know who this woman is. If he knew that this woman and that was washing, you know, crying and kissing his feet and, and so forth, if he knew who she was, ah, he wouldn't let her do it. He's not a man of God. But Jesus, being God, read his mind. And he said, look at you. Let me tell a story. What if somebody, let's say you lend somebody money, Somebody, for the sake of argument, somebody 500,000 500, won, another 50,000 won. And if you forgave both of their debt, who would be more grateful to you? And obviously, they said, well, the person that you forgave the larger sum, the amount, 500,000 won, he says, you're right. And this is what this woman is doing. From the moment that she came, she she did not stop crying. She did not stop kissing my feet continuously on her knees. Why? Because she was forgiven of all her debt. And because she knew that, because she had experienced that, all this woman was doing was simply expressing her gratitude. You see, her sin was forgiven by me. We need to go back and a little bit more of this story to understand. In this time, in this culture, what this Pharisee did to Jesus was really considered rude, inexcusable in any standard. In Jesus' culture during that time, when a guest comes over, basically the first thing they did was uh, when you greet someone, you greet them with a kiss. It's their, it's their culture. If you're like an, you know, someone of similar standing, you kind of greet each other uh, with a kiss, kiss on the cheek. If somebody is higher than you, then you kiss them on their hand. If you know this story, at this time, Jesus was considered, this man even called Jesus a prophet. His title was also rabbi, a teacher. That is a person of high position. So in, a, in any typical you know, setting, if Jesus was invited to someone's house, what they should be doing is going to Jesus and greet him with a kiss on his hand. Because Jesus is in a much higher position. And yet this man came and Jesus came, but totally he ignored Jesus, didn't do anything. It's sort of like, you know, Deacon Che inviting us over to his house and not giving us coffee. I'm just kidding. Not that. It's like Deacon Che invited us over to dinner and we come in. And yet as soon as we come in, he sees us. He's lying down, sitting down, watching television. And he sees us coming in, and he doesn't even acknowledge us. He doesn't even look at us and simply goes back and continues to watch TV. That is rude. That is inexcusable. You invite somebody over, and yet when they come, you don't even acknowledge them. 
And this is exactly what this Pharisee was doing. In about the washing of the feet, I mentioned this before. In that culture, when you sit, as soon as you come down, especially when it's dusty and hot, you come, one of the job is servant's job is to wipe the feet, wash the feet of all the visitors and guests, especially before they eat, they dine. And yet this was not offered. It's sort of like doing this. It's, again, inviting, you know, I'll pick up somebody. Deacon Kim inviting me over for dinner. He says, please, Pastor Paul, come for dinner. I come in. And as soon as I come in, he tells me, oh, I'm sorry, but uh, do you mind? Uh, I, I didn't cook any meal. So what, can you go in and cook the meal and, and serve the food? And after the dinner, he says, oh, by the way, can you also do the dishes before you go? That is unheard of. Basically, that's what this man was doing. He was that rude when he did not offer to wash these, you know, or have his servant wash his feet. And another thing about anointing of the oil, in those days, again, water was not plentiful, especially during summer when it's hot and when it's dusty. You know, simply put, people were smelly. <laughs> you sweat, you, you're hot. People don't take baths or showers back then. You're smelly. It was, it's a common courtesy to offer them, you know, an anointing of the oil as perfume. And in those times, perfume were expensive. I mean, a simple jar was worth, some say, either one month or three, one month to three months salary, average salary. That's how expensive oil was. And yet, you anoint them. It's common courtesy because, you know, you're hot and nobody wants to smell bad. And yet, he did not offer Jesus any of those things. It's sort of like us coming in and let me pick on somebody else. Ilbin inviting me over to his house. I ran, I jogged from Chungnam University, and I'm hot and I'm sweaty. And I said, oh, can I wash my hand? He goes, nope. I need to use the bathroom. Can I pee? Nope. Before I eat, can I eat? Nope. That is so rude. You can't use the bathroom to wash yourself, clean yourself. And basically, that's what this man was doing. It's equivalent to that. He was being very disrespectful to Jesus. Consider all those things, and yet, what did this prostitute woman do? The moment that she entered, she got on her knees, went to Jesus' feet, and she kissed him on his feet. I told you, when you're of equal standing, you kiss each other with a greet, greet each other with a kiss on the cheek, your same level. If somebody's higher than you, then you kiss them on their hand. But this woman did not consider kiss Jesus on the cheek, nor on, on his hand. But she chose to get on her knees and go to his feet and continue to kiss his feet. That's what she felt about Jesus. That was her heart. Why? Because she was so grateful to God. This passage tells us the reason why she did all these things was simply because she was forgiven. This prostitute woman showed this enormous amount of emotion. Why? Because she was forgiven. And it was that forgiveness that filled her with gratitude and thanksgiving. And because she was so filled with gratitude towards God, the moment that she entered, she began to kiss Jesus' feet, something that dogs do. But that's what she felt about Jesus. And then she began to wipe his feet, wash his feet, a job of her servant. And she didn't use water, but she used her tears. She didn't use a cloth, a rag, but she chose to use her body, part of her body, her hair, to wipe Jesus' feet. And then in the end, she took a, a jar full of perfume. I mean, this was probably, I don't know, my guess is probably her savings. How much, how wealthy could she be? And she didn't just put one or two dabs of perfume, but she poured a jar full of perfume. You see, she had this loving heart for Jesus. And the reason for that was because her heart was filled with gratitude. She was grateful to Jesus because he had saved her. And all the things that she did was simply her expression of that gratitude, of that thanksgiving. 
You see, true expression of love comes out of gratitude. I remember when I first became a Christian at the age of 21, some of my friends wondered why I spent so much time at church. Literally, I spent five, six days out of the week at church. I went to church Friday night. I went to church Saturday. I went to church Sunday. I was a Sunday school teacher. I went to the... uh, I went to campus ministry. So to these, to these you know, people, they're like, why is Paul going to church so often? I volunteered uh, at a homeless shelter. Uh, I, I gave 10% of my, 10% or more of my earnings to God. And people were wondering, why is Paul doing all of these things? And the answer was really simple. The reason why all the, I did all of these things was simply because I was so thankful to God for forgiving me of my sin. And everything that I did was a natural expression of that gratitude. You know, people ask me about, you know, how do you become a Christian? How do you know you're a Christian? I mean, there's no one right answer. Everyone becomes Christian in different ways. Some people, it's gradual. They're born into a Christian family, and they kind of learn, and eventually, without some of them, without even knowing, they just automatically live a life of, you know, serving God and obeying God. And then there's people like me. All of a sudden, I lived a really a sinful life, rejecting God, playing and goofing around. And I, all of a sudden, within one day, my life just got turned upside down and my life changed. And people wonder, you know, what happened to you? What is it about you that made you, you made your life change upside down like that, you know, so quickly? And really the answer is this. And I, I've said it this way many times. I was so in love with God. You know why? Because I was so thankful to God. When God saved me for the first time, you know, you hear that all the time. You hear that all the time, that God loves you, Jesus loves you, He died for you, He saved you. I grew up at church from the age of 14, but none of those words meant anything to me. But one day, that words just came into my heart, and it just really spoke to me. And I realized for the first time, oh my goodness, God truly died for me. He saved me. When Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, he died because of me. He went through all that pain and suffering, all that humiliation. He did that for me. For me, someone that didn't care, you know, one iota about him. Someone that rejected him all these years. Someone that cursed him and made fun of him for all these years. He did that for me. And that realization forever changed my life. And people ask me, you know, Paul, why do you do all these things? And I said, because I love God and I owe him. Not out of guilt and burden, but I owe him simply because I owe him because he has forgiven me of so much. And my heart was filled with so much gratitude that naturally that was my expression of my love for him. So I began to go to church. I volunteered Sunday school. God loved me so much, I wanted to repay him for all the things that he did to me. God said, the way you repay me is by loving others. So that's why I began to volunteer, to volunteer work for homeless shelter. I began to start ministry, uh, uh, campus ministry at U of H. I began to do children's ministry at church. All these things. Why? Because I wanted to pay back God for all the things that he did for me. It was an expression of my gratitude. That is the reality. See, loving heart doesn't just simply come to you because you wait for it. A loving heart doesn't simply come to you because Holy Spirit just boom, or, you know, consumes you. That's what I was expecting. I mean, that's part of it. But loving heart comes from the realization of how much you owe someone and how you should be, how much you should be, thank, how much you ought to be thankful for for someone, for all the things that they've done. You know, it's true even for people in all the relationships. It is true for you and it is true for me. People that really love me and show love for me, it's simple. It's those people that are thankful to me. People that are thankful to me for the sermon that I preach. People are thankful to me for praying for them. They're the ones that really show a lot of love for me. And obviously, on the opposite end, people that really doesn't show much love for me are the ones that are really, they're like, well, you know, what does he do? Type of thing. And same for me as well. 
people that I have more loving feelings towards are the ones that I feel gratitude. It's true. I have more loving feeling towards people that I have more gratitude. You know, I have a lot of gratitude. To, you know, you know, I, you know, I, I'm being tr totally truthful because I talk to my wife. Oftentimes, you know, oh, I'm so thankful to Luke because, you know, even though he's so ugly and, and I'm trying to see if he's paying attention. <laughs> you know, he's been doing a lot about picking up people on Sundays and, and giving rides and all these things. And it's not easy because he has to drop people off and he has to come back to church. And then he's, he takes the bus back home. And I, you know, my wife and I, I'm so thankful to him. You know, so we often talk about it and I have this love towards him. And I, I, and I want to do something for him. Uh, but uh, I don't know what to do. I feel the same way about Amiti. I feel the same way about Oyuka and, and Andra for the past few months. They, you, know, you notice where they're sitting? Always. You know, Ilbin, did, did you ever have to ask those two girls to come sit in the front? He, he doesn't. They're always sitting there in the front. And they see me, they smile. And I just have so much gratitude towards them. And I tell my wife all the time, oh, they're so cute girls. And, you know, if William was, you know, 10 years older, we might, you know. <laughs> But too late, Androjka, he already found the woman in Juni. I mean, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, what am I saying? <laughs> that's, that's faith, that's faith. But naturally, same way, when I have gratitude towards you, there's a loving feeling towards, you know, that naturally comes out. So you know what I do? I pray. Some people, I'm not saying I have hatred, but some people, I don't have a, a natural loving feeling. So what I do is I pray. And I pray and I start, you know, praying about them and I say, and I start counting their blessings. Counting the blessings that they have from me. I say, you know what, you know, Ben, even though he's tired from clubbing and <laughs> but he comes to church and I'm so thankful. Damien, he was sick. He didn't make it last week, miscommunication. But I really appreciate the fact that he tried to come. And I think about those things. I pray about those things. And when I do that, all of naturally, this loving feeling comes out towards them. And the list goes on and on, and I pray for everyone. I thank so much for Mary No, Sister No, for doing the bulletin every week. You know, but at the same time, as human being, if I wanted to, I can find something negative about everyone. You know, I could say to myself, you know, you know Mary No, why, how come she doesn't have drinks ready next to the bulletins? How come she doesn't have all the cups and, you know, how come she only has orange juice? Why can't she get grape juice sometimes? You know, why, why do I have to tell her to do that, you know? I could think about that. I could look at Deacon Choi and say, you know, Deacon Choi, why, how come he doesn't bring them to church 10 minutes before service? Why does he bring them to church five minutes before? You know, if I want to, I can nitpick about every little thing. And I could say, Joy, you know, how come you're not sitting in the front row? Why are you sitting in the third row, you know? And Andy, you, took, you walked too long to get up here during your testimony time, you know? You should come up here, you know? Don't wait, make people, you know, wait. You know? Josiah, you're way too handsomer than me, and that is not acceptable in this church. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be funny, but honestly, as human nature, if we want to, we can think negatively about everyone. You know, Ilbin and Jung-yi, uh, why didn't you spend the night last night? Urgh. But you know what I did when I prayed last night and this morning? I said, wow, you know, they went to Seoul yesterday, and they had a wedding. And they drove all the way down. And I can tell Jung-Yi was really tired. And yet, even after that, they came. And I know that they wanted to go home early. But I know that they, just, they, tried, they stayed as, until our program ended, which, was, you know, which is exactly what they did. And I was so thankful to them. And then as soon as I started thinking that way, immediately, this heart of love started coming out about them. He said, that is our nature. See, heart of love comes from gratitude. It is simple as that. So going back to what I said earlier, I pray to God and I say, God, I want to have a loving heart toward my wife. And it didn't happen. I said, God, I want to love her. I want to love her. But at the same time, I'm thinking, God, please change her. Don't make her so stubborn. You know, God, you know, she's so stubborn, but I want to love her anyway. God, please help me to love her, even though she talks back to me. God, help me to love her. Really, that was my prayer. God, help me to love her, even though she forces me to eat anchovies, which I don't like. And that loving heart never came because 
my heart was not filled with gratitude. I was just saying, God, help me to forgive her. Help me to overcome her weaknesses and love her despite all of her sins and shortcomings. It's a loving heart never comes from that. Loving heart comes from gratitude. And, and sadly, it took me a while to realize that. So my prayer changed. Instead of asking God to, God, give me, give me the heart to forgive my wife. Basically, that was my prayer. Instead, I say, I began to just simply pray and give thanks for my wife. And I just started looking for all the things that she does well. And there are a lot. I just said I never really noticed them until I tried, made an effort to pray. And I began to pray to God. I said, God, thank you that my wife, she's a good mother. She spends a lot of time with my son and daughter. Yeah, she does because for me, when I come home, just playing with my children, you know, William, for like three minutes, I get tired and I pass along to my wife. But my wife, she plays with my children all day long. God, thank you. And then I, and I pray more and said, God, oh, yeah, thank you, God, that, yeah, I have a temper. And I do. I yell and I scream. You know, I don't yell and scream at anybody. But I only, there are only two people that I raise my voice to, and that's my mother and my wife. And I'm not proud of it. And I said, you know, I show this temper to my wife, and yet, she hasn't kicked me out of the house. She hasn't asked for a divorce. Oh, wow, God. And I, and I began to pray, and I said, Oh, yeah, thank you, God, that she sometimes uh, encourages me and tells me that you know, I'm going to be a good pastor, that I'm a good pastor, that I'll do well. And I thought about it, and I, say, and I realized that she doesn't just do that once or twice. She does it all the time. And I say, oh God, thank you that my wife is always so encouraging to me. And I say, oh, thank you that for my wife, you know, treating my mother well. And my mother's not here today. She will be next week, so don't mention this to her. But my mother is very picky. And I realize that uh, my wife, she does a lot. She goes home to, to visit my mother once a week. And when she goes there, all she does is cook and clean while I sit and watch TV. And she's been doing that for the past three years. And I'm like, wow, God, she did a lot. And it was in the midst where I, was, I realized how much my wife does for me. And it was at that moment that my heart began to fill with gratitude. And when my heart was filled with gratitude, all of a sudden my heart began to produce loving heart. Loving heart toward my wife. See, that's where loving heart comes from. And that is no different also in our relationship with God. You know, when I come in on each and every Sunday, and I shared this before, when I sit there, and first thing I do is I come and I pray. First of all, I say, God, you know, uh, please prepare my heart. I just want to worship you and worship you only. But if you also notice, during worship and singing and praising time, I only sing maybe about 10 or 15% of the time. The remaining time, I, I pray. And during the, prayer, during the praise time, I'm reminded of what God did for me. And all of a sudden, my heart is just filled with gratitude. God saved me. He forgave me. And I was hoping that you would sing the song. I, I just assumed you were going to sing that song. You know, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he picked me up. You know, I wish I knew the rest of the word, but, you know, when I think about the Lord, my God, and all the things that he did for me, I just have so much gratitude. And I just want to love him. 
You see, just because we are Christians doesn't mean that we have a loving heart toward God. Sometimes we're just so busy with work, so busy with life, and sometimes we do well on our own. And we forget all the things that God has done for us. So so because of that, as Christians, we must try harder. Each and every time we come before God, we need to remind remind ourselves of all the things that God has done. And when your heart is filled with gratitude toward God, I don't have to tell you to come to church early. I don't have to tell you to give offering. I don't have to tell you to, can you do this? I don't have to ask you to help with the greeting ministry, drive the bus. I don't have to ask you to, you know, volunteer for this and that. I don't have to. Because you'll want to do it yourself. See, loving heart comes from gratitude. So I want to close by reading with you the final passage, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 through 20. And this is my encouragement to you. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything. In the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. So I encourage you always, as you live your life, always give thanks to God for everything. For that is the key to a loving heart. Let us pray.